Topic Note 7.2 Coral Reef Dynamics Just like any other ecosystem, coral reefs are really a compilation of lots of interactions. Both inter- and intraspecific competition occurs, and these species are constantly competing for space, light, food resources, just about everything, and it makes it a very dynamic place. And because corals are alive and building the ecosystem from the ground up, they are part of those interactions, which makes it even more interesting. So today, there are three big ideas that we want to talk about. First, we're going to look at the constructive and destructive processes on a coral reef and the resulting zonation that occurs because of it. We're also going to tie into our previous talks about productivity and look at why coral reefs are considered high in productivity and of course look at the intense competition for space and light that occurs. We'll also talk about the importance of the coral reef in general and the threats facing them globally. And of course once again here are your learning goals. Uh, you also have them on your topic focus sheets on your scales. So definitely make sure that you understand these components coming out of this lecture. When you're in the water exploring a coral reef, it's really hard not to notice just how diverse and complex this ecosystem is. You're literally seeing hundreds and hundreds of species interacting together in very tight relationships uh, with very specific niche structures. On top of that, there's the dynamic nature of all the abiotic factors, everything from waves, currents, light, all affecting everything that's going on. So let's go ahead and get into it. So the first thing we'll look at is constructive and destructive forces within the reef. Now previously in the other set of notes, we did talk about reef formation, and there is a continuum of destruction of that particular formation. And part of that is what we call bioerosion. This is where you have living organisms actually breaking down reef structure. This can include things like uh, boring clams and sponges that will start to weaken the infrastructure of a coral uh, from usually below. And you can see the picture to the right where you have that really narrow piece holding up a coral. And eventually, you know, that's going to topple. Um, there are also that picture on the bottom kind of middle right. Uh, you actually see these little plumes coming out of the coral. Those are actually what we call Christmas tree worms, and they are boring into the coral itself as well. You also have various different types of fish that will nibble on things, uh, urchins, which will scrape things off of rocks as well. Uh, so there's a lot of different organisms that are constantly eating away at the coral. Then, of course, you have physical factors that are going to help break down coral as well. Wave action, for example, when we have a big hurricane come through, uh, which just a couple of months ago after recording this particular set of notes, we had Hurricane Irma, and there is significant damage to some of the reefs in the Middle Keys right now due to that storm. And this is the same for other storms that come through these areas. So wave action and storm damage can break apart corals, increase sedimentation, and even expose coral to air, especially during extreme low tides and wave action. But of course, with destruction comes construction. So a storm comes through and it fragments all these corals and you have all this rubble on the bottom. Then you have actual calcareous organisms, specifically things like the coralline algae. In the bottom left picture, you'll see that bright pink sort of stuff covering the rocks. That's coralline algae. And various different types of these calcareous algae will fuse all these broken pieces of rock together and coral together to create larger structures. And that is where small uh, planktonic planula larvae from other corals will settle and will start to grow on that rock base and become a new coral formation and eventually continue to build up the coral reef itself. Now, on the picture on the right, you're going to see these little metal plates, which are called calcification accretion units, CAUs, and we'll place those on the reef and actually measure the amount of calcifying organisms that will colonize that plate and grow. And the picture to the top of that uh, right picture uh, shows one of those plates with a bunch of growth on them. 
This is one of the ways we can actually study accretion rates on coral reefs. Then of course you also have the actual living coral itself. And that middle picture that's very golden with the white tips is a piece of elkhorn coral. And that's the tip of the elkhorn coral. And the white is actually the growing tip as they continue to extend out. And elkhorn is a branching coral. And of course, as you probably guessed, the golden color that you see is the zooxanthellae algae living inside the tissues of the coral. The reason why, of course, the growing tips are white is because the zooxanthellae haven't colonized those tissues yet. Uh, they're too new. Um, but as the coral grows, they will colonize and turn into golden brown. So as you might guess, there's a bit of a balancing act between constructive and destructive forces on a reef. Calcium carbonate will accumulate at a rate of around 3 to 15 meters per thousand years, which seems not a lot, but for a growing organism and a living animal like coral to grow these large structures, it's actually quite a lot. So as the balancing act goes, overall reef erosion occurs when the rate of growth is less than the rate of erosion or destruction of coral skeletons. So different conditions will set up that scenario where you end up getting decreased growth and more erosion and destruction. And this generally occurs when you have stress on the system. For example, when you have temperature rise or pollution uh, or some sort of imbalance in the system, uh, whether it be from biological populations that may be flux and change, this could cause uh, a consistent erosion of a particular reef system. Contrasting that, if you have very healthy, consistent conditions, you are going to have more constructive forces than erosional forces, and thus your reef is going to grow and flourish. Now we can look at the reef as a whole and zone it based on the different variables that are affecting it, based on you know, wave action, light, depth, things like that. So we're going to look at a few of the more classic zones that you can actually find on a coral reef. And of course, from the open ocean side of the reef coming towards the reef, you're going to have what we call the reef front or the slope. This is where corals start to become more abundant, usually around 50 meters deep and rising along a slope towards the top of the reef. The fore reef zone is just above that slope where it starts to level off and you have various different structures depending on the, the various factors that are affecting the particular reef. For example, it's very common uh, to have what we call a spur and groove formation uh, due to wave action coming in where you end up having these sort of uh, pillars of coral uh, and rock in between fingers of sand. This whole area between the reef front and slope and the fore reef area is really a great place to go diving, especially in calm seas, because it's most exposed to the open ocean, so it tends to be very clear. This is an aerial view of Lu Key Reef down in the Keys, and you can definitely see the spur and groove formations here. So the darker areas are the spurs with all the coral formation, and of course the whiter areas are going to be the grooves and the channels with all the sand flats. And of course you can see just size scale there by the two boats that are there. Uh, this is a very popular reef, so you'll see lots of dive and snorkel boats on it most of the summer and frankly most of the year. Now just past the fore reef, you hit the reef crest, or what we often call the algal ridge. This is the shallowest portion of the reef, so it tends to gain the most impact from wave energy. And you also tend to have less corals. I mean, you can have some corals that are very hardy and are able to either grow very fast or uh, they can withstand a lot of wave action. But you often find a lot of algal ridge sort of structures there as well where it's just old coral rock with algae growing on it. Now notice that all of this is sort of the windward side of the reef facing the open ocean. Uh, and that's sort of the dynamics that we're talking about with wave action coming in. Now if you move back from the reef crest, you have what we call the reef flats, or the back reef. This is an area that's generally relatively shallow in comparison to the fore reef and the reef slope. And it's protected by the reef crest, so you don't have this high or damaging wave action going on. And you will have a lot of sometimes seagrasses, uh, sometimes little patch reefs hanging out in there. 
uh, all between the reef crest and eventually the land portion, whether it be uh, an island or a continent. Now remember that when we talk about communities and ecosystems, we tend to look at productivity. And even though the open ocean is relatively low in productivity, and if you look down there uh, on the bottom right, I have some basic numbers for gross primary productivity. You have somewhere in the open tropical oceans around 18 to 50 grams of carbon per meter square per year being uh, produced. That's not a lot. Whereas you look at coral reefs, we're talking 1,500 to 5,000 grams of carbon per meter square per year. That's a huge jump. Why is that? Now, tropical waters are known to have very nutrient-poor environments. This generally will lead to low productivity, but that's not the story with coral reefs. They tend to have high productivity in very low nutrient waters. Now, the cause of this is not completely understood, but there's a few reasonings for this. First of all, we think there's a very tight cycling of nutrients by the corals and other living organisms. It's all happening right there next to the coral on the bottom. Think about it. You have zooxanthellae living in the tissues of the coral. That's really what's causing the productivity to go on. And there's a real tight cycling between that zooxanthellae algae and the coral itself. You also have high flow rates. Generally, especially on the reef slope and the fore reef, you have a high currents. And those currents are bringing in lots of water all the time. So even if the, that water is relatively nutrient poor, there's access to more nutrients over time just because of the flow rate. You also have options for upwelling and groundwater leaching from, uh, from various sources, either from the ocean upwelling or leaching from land sources. But at the end of the day, light and space on a reef are very much limiting factors. Corals and any organism really that is sessile, meaning that they don't move around, have to compete for space and they have to do so without actually moving around so much. Now some strategies for this include overgrowing your neighbor, uh, stinging your neighbor, which corals do. Remember corals are cnidarians, they have stinging cells, and they can even kill their competitors using chemical warfare. And then there are interspecies interactions. For example, algae will tend to overgrow coral, but there's enough algae eaters and grazers on the reef, both fish and sea urchins, that it keeps the algae level low enough for coral to develop and be healthy. But if there's too many nutrients in the water, for example, from runoff, algae can go rampant and overtake what the grazers can basically consume. We've also had circumstances where grazers basically decreased in population. Um, the diadema long-spined sea urchin in the Caribbean had a population crash, mostly due to a disease. And that had a big effect on the composition of Caribbean reefs because algae started to overgrow the reefs until uh, the diadema populations came back up. Now, if you look at global coral reefs, there are big differences from the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian and Pacific Ocean reefs. First of all, the Pacific Ocean itself is an older ocean. It's been around a lot longer geologically. The Atlantic is a little younger. And in general, the Pacific has a much higher diversity of corals and other marine life. And the other key thing is, is the percentage coverage of actual hard stony corals, the reef building corals. In the Pacific, it can be up to 100%, whereas in the Atlantic, uh, it's more up to around 60% or so. If you look on the picture on the right, that's an Atlantic reef, and you'll notice that there are hard corals there, the stony corals, but there are also lots of sea fans and sea whips, basically soft corals. Those don't build reefs. They add character to the reef and complexity to the reef, but they don't build the reefs. On the left picture, you'll see that's a Pacific reef, which is almost 100% covered with hard corals. So why are coral reefs important? Why do we care? Well, first of all, they do a few services for us, especially for coastal communities. That reef crest is the barrier for large waves from the open ocean, meaning that it's going to protect the coastline from that high surf and thus prevent erosion. 
due to the fact that they're highly productive, they're also going to remove a lot of carbon dioxide from both the water and the air. They also support some of the largest diversity in any marine ecosystem, specifically considering all the different higher taxa that are there. You can see I've got lots of pictures about different organisms. We have everything from squid, uh, we have stingrays, we have various different worms like the bristle worm and sea urchins and sponges and various different corals. There's flatworm there at the bottom, uh, barracuda, various different types of fish, obviously. So much diversity. I could never even begin to touch it on this slide. And of course, on top of that, it provides recreation. People like to go out boating, diving, and snorkeling around coral reefs. This is a huge part of the economic structure here in Florida and of course in other tropical zones around the world where tourists like to come. Another aspect that's not as well talked about and we're actually going to get into a little bit later on in another lecture is the pharmaceutical aspect. What you may or may not be aware of, most of the medications that we have actually come from natural sources. Basically we look at nature's chemistry of various different plants and animals and whatnot and we look at those chemicals and see if we can use them for medication. Well, the ocean is a huge treasure trove of chemicals. Partially this is due to the fact that there's lots of competition on the reef for space and you have sessile organisms like sponges and corals and algaes and whatnot all competing for space and because they can't really move, they use various different metabolites and chemicals to repel uh, and deter other species from growing so they can have space. And those chemicals can be used for things like cancer research. And there are many actual medications in development right now from the marine environment for all sorts of ailments and diseases. If we lose coral reefs, just like rainforests and other diverse habitats, we lose those chemical compounds forever and some of them we haven't discovered yet, so we're losing things we don't even know exist. So of course there are lots of threats to coral reef communities, and part of it is destructive fishing practices. Now you might not think coral reefs and fishing, but there is a special type of fishing that goes on. First of all, usually in less developed countries where a lot of the uh, fish that we would know of is sold for money, the people there are left with some of the lower and smaller reef fish to be able to consume and eat themselves. And so by removing a lot of numbers of these fish, and they generally at that point tend to be grazers and, and other sort of lower level fish, trophic level fish, and that really disrupts the ecosystem that's there. You end up having excess algae growth when you remove them. But another really big one is the tropical fish industry. If you've probably noted, uh, there are aquarium stores all over the world selling marine tropical fish. Now, those fish come from somewhere, and unfortunately, a good number of them come from the wild. Now, here in the U.S., we have very strict laws against, uh, or for, actually, collecting, meaning that you, you do have to follow very strict protocols to collect commercially from our waters, and some species are completely forbidden. The majority of tropical fish actually come from other countries. And the way and the methodologies that they collect these tropical fish on these reefs is not always sustainable. Some of those practices include squirting cyanide out into the water, into the reef environment. That's what you see on the bottom right there. And that cyanide will stun the fish allowing the fishermen to actually go with nets and collect them very easily. The problem with this, of course, is that those fish exposed to cyanide will eventually die. At that point, it's just a race to get those fish sold to a distributor, shipped to whatever country they're going to sell them in, put them in that pet shop, and get them sold to a consumer before they die. So how do you know if your fish that you're trying to buy at a fish store is collected in this way? The only real way to know is talk to the pet shop owner, the aquarium owner, and ask those questions. And if they don't have good answers, you might not want to buy a fish from them. Because of course the flip side of that too is the cyanide is going to hurt the coral and end up decimating reefs.
The other thing that they will often do is actually dynamite reefs to basically expose and get rid of all of the little crevices that fish hide in so they can actually catch them easier as well. Either way, all of these practices are very detrimental to these coral reefs. Then of course we have other aspects that go into this, like coastal development, um, which you know we have here in Florida quite a lot. Um, and because we have such a high population along the coastline, we have lots of waste products that go out into the canals uh, and into the ocean, usually containing things like pesticides and toxic waste, and of course nutrients, which can often unbalance the system. The other thing that we do have an issue with is coral mining, where they'll actually uh, bring coral up, kill it basically, to make things out of it, whether it's decorative objects, jewelry, sculptures, whatever the case may be. And of course, all of that is causing harm to the reef as well. Then of course, there's the tourist impacts. Unfortunately, tourists, especially ecotourism, a lot of people want to go out to these environments, which is really great but they often don't know how to act in those environments. And if you see the picture on the right with the divers standing on and laying down on the bottom, these are huge no-nos because you're damaging the coral. If you touch the coral, if you kick the coral with your fins, you're damaging the tissue of that coral. And then that coral could be susceptible to diseases and other infections, and thus it can die. That's a really big issue. So we need to educate tourists that are coming out to these areas to try and improve their interaction and make that a positive interaction in the environment rather than a negative one. And of course a byproduct of having uh, coastal resorts and tourism is that you do have a lot more pollution going out into the environment or potentially going out in the environment if it's not designed correctly. Everything from nets and fishing line that gets hang out there, plastic bottles that get out there, um, sewage that gets run off, uh, these are all aspects that can be controlled and can be environmentally friendly, but it's not always done properly in the real world. And that can cause significant damage to the exact thing people want to come and see and spend their money on. So what happens when coral is stressed? Now remember, corals depend on that symbiotic relationship between themselves and the zooxanthellae, the, those dinoflagellates that live inside their tissues. So I kind of relate it to this. The zooxanthellae are like a roommate, okay? And if the roommate is doing their job and you're in a good relationship with them, they're paying rent, they're cleaning up their mess in the kitchen, you know, everything's going great. But let's say the water quality gets bad and the and Thedley are not able to photosynthesize anymore. At that point, the zozanthelae are kind of becoming a liability. They are still living things. They're still going through respiration. They're still needing to consume energy and food, um, but all of a sudden, they're not providing anything of worth to the coral. In fact, the opposite. They're actually draining resources from the coral. At that point, the coral is going to expel them, just like you would if your roommate stopped paying rent or stopped cleaning things and making a mess all over the place. Once that zooxanthellae gets kicked out of the coral, the coral becomes very white. Remember, the color of the coral comes from the zooxanthellae. So once the zooxanthellae is gone, the coral is going to look white because it has that calcium carbonate, CaCO3, base and skeletal system, and that's what's going to shine through. So what causes this to happen? Well, there's a number of reasons. Everything from increased temperature, which can cause a stress on the coral, increased sedimentation rates where the light is not being able to get down to the coral, aerial exposure, bacterial infections can cause these problems as well. So in the image on the bottom there, it shows a healthy reef on the left and then the progression of bleaching. And then of course, after the coral dies completely, algae growing over it and things like that. Unfortunately, once the bleaching occurs, unless zooxanthellae are able to recolonize and things are able to go back to normal, this weakens the coral. It makes it more brittle. It decreases the calcification rate. And a lot of times these corals end up dying. Now, of course, there are also coral diseases. And we have over 20 diseases identified, and I'm sure there's probably even more out there. 
Now, of course, some of these, like black band disease, is more of a cyanobacterial thing, uh, whereas uh, others like white band disease and dark spots tend to be bacterial. And so we're still working on understanding uh, really the pathology of all this. But at the heart of it, generally, corals become susceptible to this sort of thing based on environmental stresses. If you have a large amount of environmental stresses, like temperature increase and pollution, it's going to result in corals becoming compromised. Climate change has a definite impact on coral reefs. First of all, as we talked about in the past, increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere generally means more carbon dioxide is diffusing into the ocean. So not only is increased carbon dioxide increasing the overall global temperature of the planet, including the water, it's also changing the chemistry of the water itself. And of course, carbon dioxide combines with water to create carbonic acid and that can release hydrogen ions and thus decrease the pH, thus ocean acidification. Now, ocean acidification is of course going to lead to problems for any calcareous organism where their exoskeletons or endoskeletons, in the case of corals, are going to become weaker. They're not going to be able to accrete uh, calcium carbonate as fast or as efficiently as they did before. What all of this combines to do is make a more stressful environment for corals in which they are more susceptible to disease, more susceptible to being broken or not growing very fast, and eventually dying completely. Now we'll sort of end on a positive note, <laughs> and that is artificial reefs. Artificial reefs have really become a really big thing around the world because uh, really all you need to do is provide a solid substrate and marine life will come and colonize it. The picture on the far left is actually the reef modules that were put down, uh, the Andrew Harris Foundation uh, reef modules that were put down at Blue Heron Bridge in 2016. Uh, this is a picture of them just a day after they were put down, so they don't really have much growth on them there. Um, they've been down there a couple of years now, and they are just teeming with life now. And of course, they don't have to be as complex as that. Sometimes just putting limestone boulders down on the bottom will do it. Or, which is another big thing, sinking ships. Ships that aren't used anymore, they take all the oil and all the chemicals out of them, they sink them, and they become great reef habitats. Not only that, divers love to go there and see them, and there's history involved with these ships. So it really adds to the lure of going down there and seeing them. On top of providing habitat for lots of marine life, they also tend to protect shorelines because, again, they help dissipate wave energy. All right, that's enough from me. So here's your in-depth question. What impact would losing coral reefs ecosystems have for human beings? Okay, until next time, keep thinking.